Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this special primetime webinar, webinar here from the headquarters at Sure Incorporated in lovely Niles, Illinois. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza. I'm joined today by my cohort, Chris Lyons, and we have a very special guest today, Mr. Michael Pedersen, who is our historian here at Sure. He keeps track of where we've been and what we've done and all the great stuff we've got. And today he's going to help us dig a little bit into the inside story about the SM58. We make this microphone, you might have heard about it, it's called the SM58. It's done pretty well for us over the years and we've been making them for 50 years now. So we are celebrating its 50th anniversary and this is just another great way for us to kind of celebrate its history and where it's come from. Um, but before we get into all that great history and all that great information, just a few items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, as they usually are, um, and it will be available at the Sure archives at sure.com slash training probably in about a week or so. All of our past webinars are archived there, so you can find all sorts of great learning across a lot of sort of different topics. So please feel free to go there, peruse past topics we've done, sure.com slash training, just a lot of great education there across a wide variety of audio topics. And then second of all, as we go through the webinar today, please feel free to type any questions you have in the question pane. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the ses session. If you can't see the question pane, just look for a little toolbar that has an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that and that will maximize your pain and will give you access to the question box. Um, so that wraps up all the boring stuff. Let's get into the interesting stuff. Take it away, Chris and Michael. Thank you, Cheryl, very much. And uh, this is, you know, a lot of our webinars are very educational, very technical. This one's just plain fun. So if you're a Sure fan, uh, we've uncovered some really interesting stuff. I think so. Yeah. So, Michael, thank you for joining us, first you're of welcome, all. Chris. Because Probably uh, nobody within these walls knows quite as much or has spent as much time digging and digging and just reading and opening banker's boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Sad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to find the interesting little nuggets. So uh, uh, let's start with, uh, if I can do this, there we go. All right, so, you know, I, I thought it was good to start with sort of the technical origin mm -hmm. story. You know, a lot of, this year we've, we've, and in the past year, we've talked a lot about the origin of the Unidyne, right. you know, because it was the 75th anniversary of that. Um, and Ben Bauer was uh, the sure engineer who crafted that original Unidyne uh, microphone. That was in 1939. At the ripe old age of 24. <laughs> was he really? Just 24 years old? Yes. yes. Wow, I was worthless at 24. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm still worthless. <laughs> And when you get to 24, I'm sure you'll amount to yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> then uh, Unidyne 2 came along, which was uh, smaller and and uh, it had some technical advances to it in 1951, mm -hmm. which Ben Bauer also worked on. Uh, and then when did Ernie Seeler join the company? He joined the company in 54. And now we got Ben and Ernie up there. Some the interesting thing about them is that Ben was born in Ukraine but spent most of his teenage years in Havana, Cuba before before coming to the United States. Ernie Seeler was born of German parents in Havana, Cuba. So there must be something in the water about Cuba and microphones. So, um, but he started in 54, Ben was still here, Ben left in 58, and Ben pretty much tutored Ernie. Now Ernie, uh, born in Havana, German parents, moved to Germany, and then came to the United States, and they actually worked for Electro Voice first before coming to Shure. Really? Yeah, yep. Oh. So uh, Ernie lived, you know, basically was, a student of Ben, if you will, mm -hmm. I mean, but a, a student at Shure, mm -hmm. but both absolutely brilliant engineers. Right, and and that trend continues to this day, where you've got people in our electroacoustics lab who have been here for decades. Yuri Shulman is certainly one of the mm -hmm. most senior members who worked with Ernie. Right, and and so that technical knowledge and craftsmanship kind of has just been passed. Yeah, you really you cannot get a degree in microphone engineering. I mean, uh, they they are made. Uh, on the job. So typically people are either um, mechanical engineers mm -hmm. or electrical engineers um, or just like uh, the great late John Webker, a tinkerer mm -hmm. who just understood microphones. But pretty much you don't, you become a microphone engineer with on the job training. And that certainly was the case with Ernie. But right. both math, math geniuses, by the way. The math I look at, I don't understand at all. Yeah. So Unidyne 3 comes around in 1959, mm -hmm. and that was a big deal in a lot of ways because you can see from the form factors there, there was a huge sea change in the size and shape of the microphone from big clunky mics that sat on top of a stand and didn't get moved around right. to smaller microphones that 
were much more portable and movable or could even be handheld. Right, exactly. So if you look at the, the Unidyne 1 and Unidyne 2, notice their side address. You speak into the side of them. And on the Unidyne 3, you speak into the end of it. That may not seem like a big deal, but actually acoustically it's a huge change. Um, if you think about Frank Sinatra or people in the 40s or 50s, they came up to a stand, they sang a song, and they, and they went away. They didn't move the microphone, primarily because that microphone was placed at one part where it was one spot on the stage where there was the least amount of feedback. And if you moved it from there, there could be feedback issues. But now you get to the rock and roll in the 50s and Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis, and people, they wanted to grab the microphone and move around. So there was, and you had to come up with a microphone that was easy to hold and also kept the same feedback characteristics no matter how it was oriented. Right. And that was one thing that the Unidyne 3 did. Right. It seems so obvious now, but back then it was not obvious. Right. So uh, you've got Unidyne 3 here, and mm -hmm. then uh, we decided to branch out. And one big advance that we don't really talk about too much in the transition from mics like the 545 or 546 on the previous page and the SM58 is uh, what SM stands for. Mm -hmm. and, and why did we make that transition? There was a guy that worked here at the time named Bob Carr. And the 545 was doing very well in public address, and it could be spoken public address or even like live sound. Mm -hmm. But we really weren't making much of an inroads into the studios. And studios, I mean recording studios, television studios, and radio studios. And Bob Carr was a product manager here, and he started doing some research. He started asking these recording studios, you know, and the broadcast studios, why aren't you using the 545? Well, the TV studios, pretty much said, hey, you can't have a switch on it. We can't have a switch on live TV and someone switches the microphone off. And the 545 is chrome. It reflects too much light. So give us a microphone that doesn't have a switch on it and has a non-reflective finish, and we'll take a look at it. So SM actually stood for studio microphone. Mm -hmm. And there's an ad there on the page, Chris, that you got that basically talks about everything except for live sound. Yeah, it mentions, uh, let me just uh, see here, it mentions ideal for remote news, sports, interviews, vocal recording, or wherever the announcer may need to work close to the microphone. No mention of... Announcer, not the singer. Exactly. Right. No mention of a singer. Yep. No mention of a PA system. Yep. Just, uh, you know, just all about uh, studio issues like that. So the, the, it actually came out with the SM56 was first, which was a pistol microphone. You know, it looks like a 546. In other words, the, the, the mount and then the microphone was at right angles. Right, with a pivot that right. was on top of the And stand. then the SM57 was in 1965, and then 1966 was the SM58. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, speaking of the 57 and the 58, Lots of people, you know, maintain, oh, they're completely different. No, they're actually the same. What's the real story here let's, about let's, let's set how the, similar are they? Set the straight once and for all. It's the ball grill, period. Right. So the difference is the grill on the 57 versus the grill on the 58. Right. And we were talking before in that ad on the previous page, they made a big deal about what they called that, that windscreen. Self-windscreen. Self Self-windscreen right? yep. microphone. Because prior to that, all these probe-type microphones, if you needed a windscreen or a pop filter, you had to put a foam windscreen on the outside of the mic. And there were some ball windscreens as well in Europe, but they were not permanently attached. Mm-hmm. So again, this seems real obvious now, but this was a really the first microphone that had a ball that you screwed on. It was part of the microphone. Uh huh. So it was permanently it permanently attached to the microphone. Right. Um, so if you disassemble a 57 and a 58, you know it looks a little different uh, because the ball grill threads onto the handle. Mm -hmm. the, the black plastic grill in the 57 attaches a little differently, but you start removing enough parts, and pretty soon you'll get to the same transducer, same shock mount. Right. Uh, so the sound quality is very, very similar. It's a Unidyne 3 engine, as we would refer to it as. Right. So the, the, the amount of air inside the handle, the transformer, all that is exactly yep. the same. And if you've ever listened to a 57 and a 58 back-to-back, -back, you can perceive a little bit of a difference, especially in the high frequencies, yeah, because there's differences in how the sound waves reflect and refract around the The ball grill. does something. It, you know, it, it, def it diffracts the higher frequencies different than the grill in the 57. Mm -hmm. So do they sound exactly the same? No, because they're not exactly the same as far as the acoustical design. But inside, they are the same. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, and again, about the grill, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, why does the grill dent so easy on a 58? Well, it's, it's a crumple zone. The idea is that when the microphone falls or gets dropped, that takes the impact, and a lot of that impact is not transmitted to the, to the actual unit inside of the actual element inside. Um, so 
There's, I, I love that one on the right. <laughs> that, that was, I think, I think that was the one we found on the uh, highway in Canada. I think they had been run over for about several weeks. Really? Yeah, it's, it still worked. Yeah. Um, now the, the the upper frequencies don't work properly anymore because of the ball being so strange. But if mm -hmm. we took that ball off, when we couldn't get the ball off, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that one looks like it's really yeah, it crumpled would, around. It would the, essentially the work well. But the idea is like a crumple zone on a car. So mm -hmm. it takes the impact of the fall or whatever and dissipates that. Um, one thing you can do, because everybody seems to have a dented 58 somewhere, and this is a favorite trick I want. If you go to a local hardware store and buy yourself a wooden file handle, you know, they're kind of a bulbous-shaped wood, mm -hmm. um, you can use that. You can place that on the table, put the microphone ball over that wooden handle, and then use a hammer and tap it out. And you can tap it out to be almost exactly perfect mm -hmm. after that because it's it's actually fairly soft yeah metal. It's, it's malleable yeah, yeah so you can easily kind of reform it if you g put something underneath to kind of determine yep. the shape so not that we don't want you to buy new ones but if you got one that's just dented get the old wood you can even use the broom handle if you want but the file handle is a little bit thicker and right. gives it a little bit better wood shape to it yep and one of our quality guys uh, pointed out to me once that uh, you know, no matter how badly a 58 grill gets dented, you almost never see one where it is actually broken. Yeah, I mean the wire itself. Yeah, the yeah. wires don't come apart. They don't break. Right. You don't have sharp edges and so forth. Uh, it's, it's really quite uh, amazing that the thing holds together as well as it does, even when it's really been beat up pretty badly. Um, I, I checked just before, this, before we started this about the... Um, the return rates we've got as far as in warranty returns on these things, mm -hmm. and, and it's like tenths of a percent. Mm -hmm. So literally, you know, for every ten thousand that we make, you know, might, you might get one or two that's returned yeah. for some reason. Yeah. So it's it's really incredibly reliable. And I I also remember uh, reading about mean time between oh, yeah. failures. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> um, that's a technical term, but basically, mean time between failure is if you buy a hundred of them. Um, how long does it take for the average one to fail? And for the 58, interestingly enough, it's just over 58 years. I, I think that's a coincidence. <laughs> but they should last at least like 58.5 years. I think it is something along those mm -hmm. lines. That's, what the, that's how the math works out. Yeah. And I remember talking to somebody from the military many years ago about, you know, they were required to document all this. For meantime between failures. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I told him about, you know, what the typical time was. And he said, Oh, you measure it in years? And I said, yeah, why? And he said, oh, most of the equipment we have, you know, we're dealing with days or weeks, weeks. you know, before we have to think about, you know, doing maintenance or something like that. I don't think we'd be building for 50 years if they were measured in weeks. <laughs> no, definitely not. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, 1970. This was something I didn't know mm. until just recently. What, what happened in 1970 or what was going on? Well, the 58 was not a hit. Um, the broadcasters and the radio people and even the recording studios just weren't paying too much of attention for it. And really, from 66 all the way up to 1970, I think we were selling less than one a day, which really, which really isn't much at all. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And um, there was a guy that worked here. He was a national sales manager named Roger Ponto, and he worked here in the 60s and 70s. In fact, he hired me. Um, and he remembered a meeting in 1970 where the vice president of sales was looking at the sales for these SM microphones and just going, shaking his head, saying, this, this is just not working. Mm -hmm. Let's, we should get rid of this stuff. You know, it's, we've, we've had like five years, and it's just not selling well. And Roger was in that meeting. He said, well, before we, before we can it, we've already got it and so forth. Why don't I take it to Las Vegas? And Las Vegas was booming in the 70s and see if I can interest some of the sound guys out there in using it for live sound. Mm -hmm. And so he took it out to Las Vegas and um, the Sahara, and I remember the Sahara and the Sands and Caesar's Palace were some of the first ones, and the Frontier were some of the first ones to adopt mm -hmm. it. And it turned out that it really worked well mm -hmm. uh, on live, you know, for live sound, as far as better game before feedback, the sound as well. And the performers kind of liked the way it felt. You know, it just has that right heft and the right weight and so yeah. forth. And I'm not saying that Vegas basically saved it, but it certainly extended its life. And then sales started to go up from there. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually the rock and roll market kicked down. I remember the first time I saw it was in 1972. I was repairing. I worked at a guitar store in Urbana and was repairing electronics. And this microphone came in and said, what the heck's this? I'd never seen it before. And there, it was my first mm -hmm. one. And so eventually between the acts that passed through in Vegas 
and other things started to pick up. Mm -hmm. But it still, you know, it still took probably to the early 80s to it really, really became mm -hmm. established. Yeah. I mean, even if you go back and look at pictures from Woodstock, you know, which was... Those were all 565s. Exactly. Those were all 565s. The 58 hadn't really made enough inroads yet that it was common on the, the live sound guy, circuit. A guy named Bill Hanley, who uh, basically did most of the sound at Woodstock, uh, was the one that got the 565s on there. He also got them uh, on the Beatles tour as well. Oh. He, was do he was doing sound in Boston for a band called The Remains, and the Beatles came through Boston, and after the concert, the uh, Beatles manager comes up to, I think it was Hanley, and said, why the Remains sound so good? <laughs> <laughs> and so the Beatles switched to, um, sure, I think they were 546s for the rest of that tour. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Bill Hanley was uh, instrumental with getting the 565 on the Woodstock. Probably would have had the SM58 if it had been more popular. Yeah, if there had been a lot of them out there. Right. Right. But yep. the 565 was, you know, well entrenched by that point. Yep. So. Yep, oh, exactly. Interesting. So that's what almost happened in the base. Imagine if we had discontinued it. You know, you Incredible. wouldn't be driving those five Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> well. You, you know, the other thing that's interesting uh, is that for decades after uh, the 70s, mm -hmm. Sure used to, and used to do some of these, Sure used to send a contingent of people to Las yep. Vegas every couple of years and stage a live sound clinic, uh, repair clinic. Repair clinics, yeah. yeah. We used to go out there, and this is before wireless microphones became popular. Mm -hmm. And so we used to take parts out there, and we would repair sure microphones for free. Mm -hmm. And we would do it, had to do it at night, early in the morning, because that's when these guys worked. Right. And that's where I first learned the beating out the ball with a, uh -huh. uh, with a wooden file handle trick. Yep. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so we used to do that, and by keeping their, you know, keeping the microphones in repair, they were very loyal to us. And also made it really hard for competitors to come in. They said, well, all our sure mics are fixed. Yeah. 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 They never wear out if you keep fixing them. Once wireless became popular, you just couldn't do that because it was just too complicated to do the repairs. Yeah. But, it was yeah. more than just the mechanical stuff that mm -hmm. needed to be yep. fixed. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Another question that comes up on our FAQs pretty, uh, pretty frequently is, you know, how much sound pressure level can a dynamic mic take? And or at what point does an SM58 start to distort? You know, I keep blowing out my SM58. Yeah, th thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's or not. Let's, let's assume it's a well-designed dynamic. <laughs> uh, really, the microphone will not distort. It's linear up until the actual diaphragm is stopped by the magnetic structure behind it. Mm -hmm. um, we can't even create that lot of a sound here in our, in our sound chambers. So we calculated it's probably at 1,000 hertz, it's probably close to 180 dB SPL, which is getting close to what a Saturn V rocket is, you know, measured probably 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. So no, you cannot clip an SM58. However, if you are loud enough, the output level of the microphone itself can clip the input of the mixer. Right. So if you're hearing distortion because you're singing really loud or you've got a microphone shoved into your mouth, what you're really hearing is the output level of the microphone clipping the input on the, on the mixer. Because mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere that at, at uh, sufficient high SPLs, an SM58 can put out line level. Oh, yeah. So put, out, put out a volt or two. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it'll, peak it'll peak. easily clip the input of mixers if you haven't got your gain set right and right. if it's unexpected. Right. Um, and uh, so that's definitely one of those things. Because when you think about it, there's no circuitry in a 58. Nope. You know, it's not like a condenser mic. Nope. Um, we actually used to use uh, the, the space shuttle. Used to use dynamic microphones, the SM11, which is a very simple dynamic microphone, to monitor the sound of the rockets taking off. And that would trip these vacuum bottles that would suck in exhaust gases. Mm -hmm. And then when the, the shuttle came down, they could look at the exhaust gases to make sure that the rockets were firing properly. But they used dynamic microphones for triggering that, and those they never failed. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can clip condenser microphones because they have electronics inside them. Right. But dynamics do not. Right. And so until that thing bottoms out against the magnet, it's going to put an output level. And 180 decibels, that's that's well into the range of, of physical danger. That's oh, yeah. not just bad for your hearing. Yeah. That's 125 is usually considered a threshold of pain, so you're way, way past that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, while you're talking about that, um, how far does that diaphragm move? It literally moves millions of an inch. I mm -hmm. remember when I first started there, I asked an engineer, hey, can you show me how, you know, can, can I look at the microphone and watch it move when I talk? And he just laughed at me. He said, no. <laughs> So these things are measured in millions of an inch as far as how far they move. Mm -hmm. And we've got a blog post that I don't know if it's up yet or if it's going to come up in the next month. I think it's our November blog post about uh, some inside uh, 
uh, technical information about the SM58. Right. Yes, yeah. that'll be coming up in the next month or so. So right, and yep. we talk about more about the transducer design, the, the diaphragm, diaphragm, shock diaphragm. mount. So if you're interested in a little bit more of the guts of the SM58 and how it works, uh, definitely read that blog post. That's going to be a real interesting one. Yeah, I, I, I wrote those technical articles a while ago and researched the patents and read them, and it, and it took a while to get into it. It's just astonishing what Ernie Seeler did in that. I mean, just the details are just um, truly amazing. So you, you, you may find those of interest when we mm -hmm. get, to get to it. So just keep your eyes peeled. Um, the blog is at blog.shore.com, or you can also, if you follow us on social media, we will be posting when it's live there. And it should be within the next month or so. Yeah, great. Uh, speaking of space, so, you know, what happens when you take a microphone into outer space? Well, if it's a vacuum, not much. <laughs> you have to have air, air for it to work. But it actually works quite well. It's on the International Space Station. And uh, we had no way of testing it. We don't have any uh, anti-gravity chambers. We sold those, of course, to, to <laughs> Google now owns them uh, for testing their self-driving cars. Um, but we were very pleased when we saw the International Space Station crew using an SM58 with, an S, with a switch on it, an SM58S, to talk to students and so forth and doing some of the interviews. Sounds quite good up there, you know. We're not surprised that it worked fine. I mean, they're, they're up there breathing air. We were just really kind of thinking about, well, there's no gravity. How's that going to affect it? And it turns out it really didn't affect it in any way, shape, or form. Hmm. But quite nice to see it up there and makes us all proud that, the, you know, first on the Earth and first in the space, right? Yeah. I, I hope they secure that thing when it's time to land. Yes, uh, I think a 58 so flying around could break something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm glad not, I don't see any type of retractable cord on. That's another retractable cord is another bad idea in the space. Uh. <laughs> Let that thing go, and then they'll yeah. put a hole in the side of the, of the space. And uh, there's a second picture there on the right where they show miking a flute, uh, you know, as uh, it was some well, that's part one, of That's it. one way to do it, you know. Yeah, some, that's, that's not our primary uh, choice for miking a flute, but I think for this experiment they were, you know, trying to talk about, you know, pitch and music in space but, and that but, sort of plus thing. Plus with her hair flying, she's doing a really good imitation of Ian Anderson of the Jekyll <laughs> Tull, who used a 58, by the way, at his microphone. Did he really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah there you go. Walked up to a stand, sang into it, played his flute into it. Yep. Yep. Now, of course, the young kids in the podcast are saying, who's Jethro Tull? Yeah, but well, that's, well, let you look it up. I, Go should, Google I, I, I won't admit that I used to see them live. Then. <laughs> uh, so let's see, another one, a couple of interesting things about Ernie Seeler. These are some of those tidbits that, you know, only the people who knew him uh, really uh, had. And uh, first of all, what's what's the significance of Ernie in that frequency response curve well, there? Well, that's the frequency response of an SM58. And uh, you'll notice that starting at around 1,000 hertz, it starts to rise up, and there's a little dip around 7,000 to 8,000 hertz, or 7, 7, 8, hertz, and then it drops off from that. That's known as a presence peak, and that presence peak really adds a brightness to the sound. Uh, it's really part of the sure sound. Ernie didn't like it. He felt he had failed with this. He wanted a <laughs> flat response microphone, not a microphone with a presence peak. And it turned out that the way that he had designed the system, that presence peak was almost impossible to, to get away from. Now, isn't that interesting? Is that that's what people like about the 58? Yeah, that's part of it, its signature right. sound. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But Ernie, no, he didn't like that. We actually brought out a flat responding microphone called an SM59. I remember that one, yeah. Huge flop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it was, and, and it was just... Um, do I have time for the Frank Sinatra story? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's so, a good one. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll clean it up. So, it is prime time. Uh, yeah, this yeah, is exactly. a family webinar. Yeah, exactly. So this is 1977 or 78, and we brought out the SM59, and I was relatively new at Sure, and my boss said, Roger Ponto, here, take this SM59 to Caesar's Palace. Uh, Frank Sinatra is rehearsing there this afternoon, and get him to try the SM59. Okay, what do I know? So I go over there, and give the microphone to Dave Rogers, who was the actual sound man at the Caesar's Palace. And he walks it down to the stage, gives it to Frank Sinatra, sound man, and Sinatra comes on stage for the rehearsal, and he's handed an SM-59. The first thing he says is, what the Frank is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the sound man says, oh, it's a new microphone from Sh Sure Frank. They want you to try it. Uh, okay. So he counts off the band, you know, and he sings about eight bars. And he takes the SM59 and he throws it across the stage as far as it, and it hits the wall and bounces. And he <laughs> says, "Get me my friend, get me my friendly SM58." <clears throat> <laughs> and the sound man goes and runs it and puts the microphone. And Sinatra's just happy. He goes on with a rehearsal, and the sound man kind of comes up to the sound booth. Now I'm about 100 feet away, and he, he hands me the dented SM59, and he says he didn't like it. <laughs> 
So people like that prison speak. Yeah. You know, you think you want a flat response uh, microphone. You know, you, it seems like it should be ideal. But if you hear your voice through one, it's really dull. Yeah, exactly. It's really dull and dead and boring sounding. Right. So maybe for some musical instruments it's great, but for the voice it just really doesn't cut it. And I think that always bugged Ernie that he couldn't get rid of it. But, hey, thank God he didn't. Yeah, I was going to say, if he'd done a few more equations and figured out how to flatten it, then we wouldn't be here today. And you know you know something, Chris, about Ernie and music. What, what about Ernie and music? Oh, yeah. Well, so, you know, you'd think, you know, the SM58 is such a centerpiece of rock and roll and, and live music. Uh, Ernie did not like rock and roll. He, he only not. liked classical music. That's all he listened to. He thought rock and roll was for the birds. This is, uh, I don't understand it. That's yeah. all I would say. <laughs> yep, he was a very quiet guy. You know, I remember him in the in the cafeteria in our old building in Evanston. You know, every morning making a pot of tea. You know, very quiet. Guy. Avid swimmer too. He would swim in Lake Michigan until it almost froze over. Really? I I, I would see him because I live in Evanston where he did, and he would be out there swimming, and it's like. You know, he's like 75 years old, and it's like 45 degrees, and he's out there swimming. Wow. Yeah, he was, he was, a, he was an amazing guy. If that's what it takes to be a Mike genius. I guess no, so. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. But, yeah, he did not like rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Oh, and uh, so it knows how to swing. You know, we've <laughs> – Sinatra knew that. It, Sinatra knew it, and it, almost everybody's got their own story of w- how much punishment – an SM58 can take. Yeah. Uh, but I think these pictures are interesting because uh, Roger Daltrey with The Who uh, routinely uses 58s on stage, yep. and they're always taped up with the cable, taped up against the microphone for safety Yes, because he likes to throw it around and, and you know, and swirl it and, uh, yep. over his head and everything like that and, you know, whip it out over the, the crowd yeah. and so And you forth. know that's the only one that ever failed on him. That's why we have it. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. what's the story? How did we get this one back? Well, Daltrey's used them forever. Very, very good fan of, a very fan of, good fan of Sure, and a good friend of Sure, and a very nice guy. And he sent this one back. He just said, you know, I've never had one fail, but this one did. Could you tell me what's wrong with it? So we took it, and the first thing we did was x-ray the cable. And if you look at the bottom of that, it's a little hard to tell, but the cable, as it comes out of the XLR connector, is almost bent at 180 degrees, yeah. and the cable failed. Mm-hmm. microphone worked just fine. Mm-hmm. So we got back. That he, he felt relieved, and they said, oh, why don't you keep that? So that's one of the uh, one of the little artifacts in our archive. Right. And that box on the right, typically, uh, you know, when The Who goes on tour, they've got a box of 58s, all pre-taped, pre-cabled, ready to go. They only use, you know, a few of them on any given tour because not much happens to them. But if they do get banged up, you know, they've got a fresh new one to yep. use every night that's in pristine condition. Uh, but there's always just a box of them there off to the side of the stage. But we, we've had ones that have survived fires. We've had ones which have been under seawater for weeks at a time, um, you know, dropped from, what's the highest thing we dropped? We dropped from a helicopter. From a helicopter. Mm-hmm. I think it was 200 feet, I think. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. If you go to our YouTube page, if you go to the Sure YouTube page, um, there's a series of um, videos called the uh, Sure Mike's Microphone Abuse. And we do all sorts of crazy stuff to that thing. We burn it. We drop it. We dropped it from the sixth floor here in mm-hmm. our building. Hockey players. Uh, hockey players. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. So if you want to see an SM58, SM58 to go through their paces, we, we definitely do it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Now, uh, a lot of people ask about, you know, what has changed about the SM58 over the years. And you were able to come up with, you know, a list, list of, of things. things. And, and it's actually very interesting because, you know, it's it's sort of like, uh, you know, like the Volkswagen Beetle or something, yeah. you know, where, you know, for many years it looked almost the same on the outside, but there was a lot of changes on the inside. Well, I, I get the question is, you know, has it changed? And the answer, yes, it has, because it has to. Mm-hmm. Um we have suppliers, for example, the supplier that f- made the handle for many years, the die-cast handle. They were in Chicago. They had a fire. They never went back into business. We had to find a different handle supplier. There are adhesives that change. You know, the, the adhesive manufacturer may change. There's lots of things that change over time because we don't make all the parts. We assemble them into the microphone, but we don't make all the parts. So, I, you know, I have a, a little list. So, for example, when it first came out, it was actually a dual low-impedance microphone. Did you know that? 
I remember that. Yes, I yep. forgot. The upper about transformer that. was a dual low impedance. One impedance was around 50 ohms, and one impedance was 150 ohms, which is what it is now. Mm -hmm. The 50 ohm was a broadcast standard. Remember, uh, we're trying yes. to get to the broadcast market, right? Uh -huh. And broadcast consoles from the 40s and the 50s and early 60s, actually, sometimes the microphones went directly onto a fader, even without going through amplification first. Mm. And that, that fader happened to be a 50 ohm fader. Okay, so you wanted it to match the impedance of the fader. Yeah, exactly. In this case, because that was maximum power transfer. Yep. So that was one of the things we changed. We got rid of that dual low impedance transformer. Um, we improved the diaphragm material. The, the, the diaphragm is made out of mylar. Um, now it has a special coating on it. It made it more rigid in certain spots and more flexible in other spots. We changed that. Um, there's resistance cloth that's in the microphone. Uh, without getting into how the uniphase works, there's actually little chambers in the back of the microphone that f slow down the sound when it comes from the rear through acoustical resistance. That used to be, be made out of wool. Wool mm -hmm. changes its resistance depending if it's wet or not. Right. right? So now we have a, like a plastic material that we use. Right, and I would imagine different samples of wool are have different resistance too. Exactly, right. Um, there are some things where we used to use cement or adhesives, now we do an ultrasonic weld. Mm -hmm. That works better as well. Right. Um, all the testing procedures now are computerized mm -hmm. so that we can test them and they're all more consistent. Um, we change the type of shock mounting material from one type of rubber to another type of rubber to make it work better. So all these little improvements, they don't change the basic way it works, they just make it work better. Right. And there's a lot of other things, by the way, that we don't tell. A lot of things that we do are trade secrets. Mm -hmm. And they're really trade secrets to help us keep the market. But we have a big problem with counterfeiters, mm -hmm. as you know. And for all the listeners, I'll just tell you this. If you're going to buy an SM58, make sure you buy it from someone that's an authorized sure dealer. I cannot tell you how many things on eBay in particular and Craigslist are counterfeits. And they look like them. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the they appearance don't is easy to do. Right, the appearance is easy, but they don't sound like them. And they really, you don't know until it's afterwards. And, and the reason they're so cheap is they don't build them. If they built them like us, they'd have to charge the same amount of money that we do, but mm -hmm. they don't. Right. So really, really be careful. And if you don't know who authorized dealers are, call us up or drop us a note. And or we'll, go to we'll, our we'll, website. Go to our website. Mm -hmm. we'll, yep. we'll help you on that. But that's a big issue. And so there's a lot of things that we don't release because of that. Mm -hmm. People will write us and say, well, how do, you know, what are the things I should look for to know it's not a counterfeit? Guess what? We won't tell you because if we tell you, then the counterfeiters know as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So there have been lots of things. And, you know, estimate, I would say 40 or 50 changes. Mm -hmm. But anytime we make a change, we have to go through the whole quality assurance thing again. Right. Yep. Because particularly with a microphone, you, any little tiny thing, if something moves a millionth of an inch when it operates, right. you can imagine that any little change can make how that works. So we have to go through all that every time. And that basically keeps our QA people. Yep. Or if you, you want to change the source of a part, let's say a metal part, um, it may uh, not have any effect on the sound, but maybe it corrodes right. over time when it's right. exposed to salt right. spray right. or something. And of course, the suppliers will always say, oh, it won't be a problem. Right. But, but we don't take their word for it. Right. No, we, we, do will, not. we will do all the testing. Um, we also did a test not too long ago. Yuri Shulman, you mentioned him before, mm -hmm. actually got a, a 58 from the 60s, from the 70s, from the 80s, from the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, and basically tested them all. Mm -hmm. And the curves basically just almost lied one, one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. So um, I do get the question sometimes, well, do they change in sound? Of course they can change in sound. You can drop them. Mm -hmm. you, can make, you can make, you know, all these little subtle things. There, there could be, you know, spit on the microphone, and they could get can dirty. Things can change over a period of time. And like all humans, it's kind of you don't notice your hearing going bad. Sometimes <laughs> you like the way that microphone sounds yeah. now, you know. Um, and, and in fact, that's an interesting point that uh, we didn't discuss when we were talking about the grill is that, um, you know, you can get accumulations of, let's call it debris in the grill. <laughs> very nice. Uh, airborne debris very, very uh, coming, emanating from the user or yep. smoke particles. Or, lips, or lipstick. Lipstick. You know about that. Oh, always bring your own mic if you can. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, but that stuff can accumulate in there and start to slightly clog up the sure. grill. Right. Um, the the foam inside can get brittle uh, from exposure to ozone, mostly smoke, just ozone, ozone. Yeah, mm -hmm. just that sort of thing over time start to crumble. And those things can have sometimes a minor, sometimes a really significant impact on yep. the sound. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so washing the grill. Yeah. You know, all you got to use is warm soap and water. Use Dawn because it cuts grease like mm -hmm. that. 
buying a new grill. A new grill is what five, six bucks, something like that. Uh, yeah, may, it might be Maybe. more like twelve, fifteen dollars uh, okay. sometimes. Well, no matter I, what. Yeah, but it's it's a lot still less not the same price as a new. Yeah. Or you know, or put a foam windscreen over it and then mm-hmm. just change that too. Yeah. Lots, lots of different ways to yep. do it. Um, I was talking with Yuri a couple of weeks ago working on this blog post that we were working on, mm. and uh, he said, you know, the one thing that has changed is that the consistency from one unit to the next is much more consistent, and the consistency over time, yeah. uh, over the lifespan of the microphone, is better than it used to be, largely because of these superior manufacturing techniques and new materials. Yeah. You know, things that used to be cloth are now, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, inert fiberglass or something that doesn't deteriorate. Yeah, I, I know doing the uh, ultrasonic welding helped a lot of different mm-hmm. things as far as being consistent. Because before you would put cement on, but how much cement did you put on? And maybe it's a little bit extra uh, dripped and so forth. I mean, a lot of different things. Right, you know? right. And every, uh, every year, uh, a couple of times a year, a batch of SM58s just gets picked at random mm-hmm. and goes through the entire cycle of yep. tests so that we know, uh, is, has there been any deviation in manufacturing? And there never is, but yeah, we're on top of it. That might be interesting to the listeners to know that the, the one department that can shut down production here at any time is quality assurance. Yes, and we will have the called quality freezes, and they mm-hmm. find something that happy with, and they can shut it down and test everything else. And the sales department whines and whines and whines, <laughs> but it doesn't make any difference. Mm-hmm. And until quality is satisfied, then uh, we won't be shipping the things. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, well, Cheryl, have we uh, got some interesting questions? We have got a slew of questions, so let's um, let's dive in here. Okay. Um, here's a hot question that we get asked a lot. Um, how many SM58s have we sold in these past 50 years? Oh, we're out of time. Oh, oh that's sorry. Oh. <laughs> well, it's been exactly... <laughs> now, actually, we're a privately held company. That's the quickest way for the three of us to lose our jobs. And <laughs> yes. we like our jobs. We like our jobs if we knew the exact answer. Yeah. But but we could only just say millions and millions, and that's about the short, yes. short answer. A lot. Get, a a lot. whole lot. There's a reason it's been around for 50 years. So, right. yep. yep. We, we think eventually everyone in the world will own one. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see. Um, uh, do, 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 do. How do I know if an SM58 is on access? I mean, oh. go ahead. Well, that, that's a good question. When we say on access, what we mean is that you are facing the end of the microphone, mm-hmm. that the, the axis of the microphone runs straight up like a line through the handle. Yeah, kind of, kind of like you put it on a barbecue spit. Exactly. That's a great a great analogy. So if you put the, the microphone on a barbecue spit or on a skewer right up through the center, that's the axis. Yeah. So uh, the microphone, as you roll it, uh, should not change its sound right. whatsoever. Yeah, it that's should only sym- change. symmetrical about the axis is what we would say. Exactly. That, that That's why there's no sort of top or bottom mm-hmm. to the microphone when you're holding it. It right. doesn't matter. Right. So, yes. Mm-hmm. I hope that answered it. Okay. Uh, does phantom power have any adverse effects on dynamic mics like the SM57 or 58? No. That's, uh, assuming that your phantom power supply is designed properly and that you're using a standard cable properly, it will simply ignore it because basically you have the same voltage on pin 2 as on pin 3, and when there's the same voltage is on both pins, there is no voltage difference, and therefore it has no effect on it. Mm-hmm. So, no, it's absolutely okay. It's designed to take that and should have no effect. Was the SM58 always made with an XLR3 connector, or was it ever made with Amphenol? That's a great question. No, this was never made with an Amphenol. Um, we started using the XLR for the first time, believe all the way back in 1952. Can you believe that? Really? Mm-hmm. On a ribbon microphone that we designed for the broadcasters, because the broadcasters had adopted the XLR relatively uh, early. Okay. Um, the listener is correct. The 545 and the 565 did have Amphenols. Uh, they had four pin amphenols where you would change the impedance at the connector end. Oh, so you use by like, wiring to a different pin. Exactly right. So, ah. I, so if I remember correctly, pins two and three were the low impedance, and pin four was high impedance. Mm-hmm. But the SM57, all the SM microphones only had three pins. Right? Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, uh, this is somebody who I think came in a little bit late, so we'll kind of yeah. go over something we've been over before. But what is the major difference between the 57 and the 58? It's the ball. The grill. It's right. the ball grill. Yep. End of story. Yep. 58's got the thread-on ball grill. The 57 has got the plastic grill with less pop protection, uh, which is why it's more of an instrument mic, less of a vocal mic. And the SM57 grill is supposed to rotate. 
It's yes. not broken. Good point. So so don't tape it up. Yes. Don't glue it. It's supposed to rotate. <laughs> Right. In fact, that's an interesting trivia point. A lot of people don't know, and I've got a 57 here. There's a little uh, screen portion, maybe an eighth of an inch wide, just beneath the plastic grill before you get to the middle handle. Mm -hmm. That is part of the rear entry right. for sound waves, which helps to make it a directional microphone. Yep. If you put tape over that or put your hand over it, you destroy it's the polar It's a very panel. bad Omni. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've seen people tape it up. Because, doesn't sound right. So, no, that's a surprise. Take the tape off. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, this person says, "Hey guys, I believe the SM58 produces a slightly a slightly higher output at or above five kilohertz. What yes. do you think of that?" That is the presence peak, right? That exactly. we talked about. Yep, and, and that, it does that. Yep, and it, that's designed to emphasize uh, vocal intelligibility, uh, help it cut through a PA system sound mix, get above the music. Uh, that's the part of the uh, range where you have a little bit more consonants rather than vowels, so it helps to distinguish uh, things, make it a little bit clearer. It is not a flat response microphone. There's no doubt about that. It's not a microphone you would use for measurement, for example. No. A um, lot of people, even though this is the SM58's birthday, wanting to ask about one of its siblings um, and are asking okay. about the SM58 versus the Beta 58. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, so, and, and that was one of the first projects I worked on when oh, really? I came yeah. here was the, the Beta 57 and Beta 58. Sh should we talk about how it was going to look originally? Let's talk about yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's an interesting story. Oh, so, God, it was ugly. so, technically, the Beta 58 is Ernie, similar. It was Ernie Sheeler design, by right? The way. Still yep. Ernie Sheeler, yep. Uh, but the goal was higher output. Yep, with a neodymium magnet. Right, with a neodymium magnet, which generates more signal output, yep. and with a tighter pickup pattern, super, super cardioid, cardioid yep. instead of cardioid, yep. uh, so that you could get more gain before feedback and a little bit higher output level. Right. Um, the changes also involved a redesign of the shock mount, right. a little bit different shock mount design, Partly because they wanted to use a hardened grill. Right, so you couldn't do the grunt crumple zone thing, so you had to make sure the microphone could be dropped. That was a whole different design inside. Exactly, yep. yeah. So, but styling-wise, there was a question of what should it look like? So we went to a guy named Mort Goldshaw, and Mort Goldshaw was a very famous designer. He designed the 7-Up logo with the bubbles. Yep. He designed the Motorola M. I mean, he was a famous guy. So we send this out, and he, and he sends back to us his prototype. And it was a gray handle mm -hmm. with a bright chrome grill. Mm -hmm. And around the equator where we got the blue band now, uh -huh. orange polka dots. Orange dots. Orange dots. No, orange dots. Orange dots. Wow. On a chrome grill. On a chrome grill. Bright chrome grill, which would reflect television yeah. oh, lights. God. And, yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it was, we've got it in the archive. It was, it was really ugly. <laughs> yeah. And our president at the time, Jim Cogan, a lovely man, may he rest in peace, said, we're going with this because we paid more all this money, and he knows what he's doing. Well, we took it out and showed it around to like a few, and just were, were mocked uh -huh. <laughs> by yeah. the people, and and so we knew that that wasn't going to work. And actually, you worked on the Beta Fifty Eight. Did you know that the color of the handle was my idea? Really, I did yep. not know that. Uh, yep, because I, I, I just was looking at. Um, I've never owned a gun, but my dad owned guns. And I always thought gun blueing was a nice mm -hmm. color. Yeah. And so I just said, what if we could make the handle just kind of like a, a gunmetal blue? Mm -hmm. And so that's where that came from. Yeah. And yeah. that was uncommon. You really don't it see was. Yeah. blue as a color. And the blue stripe around that was based upon our circuitry products at the time that always had a blue stripe on it. Oh, yes. On the front of the mixers, I yep. remember the blue stripe. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that, that's how that yep. all came about. You were, the pro you were the product manager for it? Yeah, I was working with Sandy Schroeder at that yep. time. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we're that old, Cheryl. <laughs> I, did, I did not say a word. Somebody had asked, you know, why would why would you buy a Beta 58 over an SM58? Um, and I'm going to speak to that one a little oh, bit. Yeah, you're, you're, you're used you're them both. I yep. have used them both. Um, and that really all comes down to a matter of preference and, and application and how you're using it and where you're using it and what you want to sound like. Um, I personally have, if you haven't noticed, a pretty high and nasal sharp tone. Um, so for me, a Beta 58 is just a little bit too bright on my voice. Um, so I prefer more of the SM lines or a KSM8, <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which I happen to be speaking on right now, um, because it gives me a little bit more warmth. Whereas a uh, fellow singer that I sing with who has more of a very deep, 
dark, soulful, bluesy voice. She mo- she loves the uh, Beta 58 mm-hmm. because it gives her a little bit of an extra cut. Yep. So, you know, if you're trying to decide between an SM58 or a Beta 58, I'm going to give you the same advice I give everybody when it comes to picking a vocal mic, and that is find a dealer or a sound engineer friend or somebody who has a nice mic locker and try it out yourself. You won't know you like it until you hear your voice on it, on a PA, coming back at you. It always, it always amazes me how a singer, and you can consider the microphone as a part of their voice, if you will, mm-hmm. will just go out and just take whatever microphone they got. Now, a guitar player will never buy a guitar without trying out a bunch of guitars mm-hmm. and drummers and everything else. Like that. I don't know why singers don't do the same thing. Just That's a good point. You know, it's it's part of their instrument, you know? right? I think I think once you get a singer, once you give them options, um, I have another friend that I sing with, and she was very. She was like, "Oh, just give me whatever, just give me whatever." And finally, one day, I said, "Listen." I want you to try these different mics. And she's like, I'm not going to know. And after she tried three different mics, when she was done, she looked at me and she's like, oh, I know which one I like. There you go. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's definitely worth getting in there and finding it. It is, you know, it is the last point of control you have before you get out to the front of house. And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. if you're really serious mm-hmm. about your sound, you know, take take control of it. Plus, you know, germs. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's true too. Now, the other people that like the betas uh, because of the tighter pattern are people who like loud wedge monitors. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and this isn't quite as much of a thing nowadays now that a lot of people are using in-ears. in-ear monitors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But mm-hmm. when people were starting to run two wedge monitors to get... Kind of left and right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That really is a great situation for a super cardioid pattern like a beta 58. You'll Definitely. get more gain before it feedback that way. Definitely. By the way, who came up with the term super cardioid? Uh, I don't know. Ben Bauer. Ben Bauer, okay. <laughs> yep. Found it in his notebooks. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Um, here's an interesting question, one we probably can't answer. Is the 58 the most popular mic Sure has created and sold? Um, as far as quantities? I don't know. Quantities sold? Definitely as far as quantities yeah, sold. As far as quantities sold, yes. The biggest it's... seller we've ever had is the 58. Number two is the 57. Yeah, and it is the world's most popular microphone, so... Yeah. Yeah. But it would be interesting, if we could, and we can't because we don't have the records, to go back and count all the Unidynes that we've sold, the Unidyne 1s and 2s, mm-hmm. you know, the Elvis mics. Yeah, since that's a good been, point. Since they, they've been sold since 1939, it could be quite a few, but we just don't have the records back that far, so I don't know. Interesting. Right. Um, what's the difference between an SM7B and an SM58, and why is the SM7's output so low? Ah, an SM7B is an SM57 in disguise, um, but it has a much larger rear chamber. The, the, its butt is bigger. Yeah, the area behind the, the area behind Exactly. And by doing that, you get the extended low end. Um, the primary reason that the output is lower is, number one, you're a lot farther away from the actual mic element. If you take that windscreen off and look, there's a cage that stops you at least about two or three inches away yeah. from the mic element. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can't get as close to the mic element. There's also that passive circuitry on the output, which allows you to roll off the frequencies and, and boost the frequencies, and it also gives you a little bit of output level difference as well. Right. So you can't get as close to it, and you have that passive, those passive circuits. And that was originally designed as a broadcast announcer's microphone right. who typically worked the mic very close. Right. Number one, and go ahead, we'll go and on. and go into a, a mixing console with a lot of gain, with plenty of gain, right. and it's a very quiet console. So. Right. It, output level wasn't the big concern. Right. That's the biggest question we get into is that um, there's, since so many people use condenser mics, and condenser mics have amplifiers in them, preamps in them, they have a very hot output. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a hot, hot, hot output out of the condenser, you don't have to put that gain into your mixing board. So you could take a condenser microphone and go into a mixing board that doesn't have a lot of gain, and everything works fine. But now you put an SM7B in there, in that mm-hmm. same mixing board, and it doesn't have g- enough gain to make it up. So we always tell, if you're going to use an SM7B, check the specs on your mixing board. There should be at least 60 dB of gain in the mixing board, if not more, for it to work properly. Mm -hmm. But that's a microphone that was introduced in 1972, and now we sell more of those than we ever had before. And it's Mm -hmm. a great-sounding mic if you've never heard it. It is great. Okay, um, another sort of question about different mics. How different is the Unidyne series from the SM57 and 58? The, you mean the Unidyne 1 and the Unidyne 2? We'll assume that's what they mean, like the I Ellis mics. Because so, yeah. the 57 and 58 are the Unidyne 3. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the acoustical idea, the way it's made directional, is basically the same. So the, the acoustical network that makes it a cardioid pattern, a mm-hmm. super cardioid pattern, is, is the same. 
Um, but the frequency responses are, and the, co- the polar patterns are quite different because remember, one's, an, one's a side fire, mm-hmm. the unidine and the unidine 2 is a side fire, and it's not symmetrical about axis. And so its r- polar pattern is relatively rag- ragged compared to an mm-hmm. SM57 and the SM58. Um, as far as sound quality goes, remember, Chris, when we did that sound comparison, when we did a ni- 1939 unidine and yeah. so forth, all the way up to 2015? Mm-hmm. 1939 sounded pretty darn good. Yeah, it did sound nice. So you would find if you listen to a unidine 1 or 2 compared to a 58 or 57, that the polar patterns are different, and the unidine 1 and unidine 2 do not have as much high end. They, mm-hmm. sound, they sound a little more ribbon mic ish mm-hmm. if, if you will. Right. But somewhere at the Shure, in the Shure FAQ, we have Chris doing a demonstration of all those microphones. You can hear a 39, a 51, an 89, a 2009, and 2015, I think. Mm-hmm. And we were all amazed when we heard the 1939. It's pretty shocking. It is shocking. Yeah. You, you realize then that there was nothing wrong with microphones in 1939. It's the recording medium that yeah. was the issue mm-hmm. that was noisy and, and clicky and poppy. The microphones were just fine. Mm-hmm. Which is why a microphone that's 50 years old still sounds, <laughs> still good. sounds good. You got it. Okay, if I buy and use a cheap connector or XLR for my SM58, does it affect the sound output? Um, I wouldn't say the connector does. The, certainly the amount of shielding on the cable will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cheap cables have maybe only 60%, 70% shielding. It can be mm-hmm. some hum and buzz. Um, basically, a decent mic cable should cost you at least a dollar, dollar fifty a foot, approximately. Mm-hmm. approximately. Yeah. But don't go out and buy monster cable that costs you five dollars a foot because you're wasting your money. <laughs> um, look, look at you know very look look at the, the maker of the cable. Belden makes great cable. Um, Gebco, mm-hmm. um, West Penn, yeah. Mogami. Uh, Mogami, exactly. Mm-hmm. Look at the manufacturer. And then the name brand connectors. And also. name brand, yeah. Neutric, Neutric, Switchcraft, Switchcraft. Yeah. Yep. And then uh, and usually. The other big thing is uh, reliability of those cables. Mm-hmm. You know, they might be okay when they're brand new, but, you know, you coil it up, throw it in the bag, and use it, you know, 50 times. Yep. Sooner or later, you're going to maybe have some faults. Yeah, so the the connect, uh, the connector may be a problem if it doesn't mate properly, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's, here's, I just thought about this. Let's imagine you got a, um, a female connector, mates with a 58, and let's say it's a little bit loose and sloppy. If you've got phantom power flowing on that, it's going to get... Cracks and pops. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. It'll yeah. get yeah. crackly. So, you know, a, a decent cable with decent building cable and, and Neutric connectors isn't going to cost you that much more, and you probably only have to buy it once in your life. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we've got a question here from a fledgling sound person um, asking uh, how some people can be 6 to 10 inches from their mic and be heard perfectly while others, including many top singers, are right up on the grill when they speak or sing. Even adjusting gain, I haven't found success when a person isn't close to the grill. <laughs> well, that's a very that's a worth a webinar by itself. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I wonder uh, if we've done that before. I think we have. Do, have we got something about microphone techniques? In Not previous necessarily, webinars? but we've talked about game before feedback. Yeah, repeatedly. Right. Yeah, and th- and there's a couple things going on. There's game before feedback, and there's also just the 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 sound quality, the tone of the microphone at different working distances. Can we make a, just a quick pitch for PAG? Yeah. Well, that's okay. a good one. Yeah. Um, there's. There is an underlying mathematical formula called potential acoustic gain, and it applies to all public address systems. And in the uh, if you if you go to Sure, we have an FAQ section, and you can do something on PAG, something on PAG NAG, P A G N A G, or potential acoustic gain, and it shows you how loud a sound system can be based upon distances. And the distances are singer to the microphone, microphone to the loudspeaker loudspeaker to the audience, and then from the singer to the audience itself. Mm-hmm. And I cannot believe how many sound people out there and call themselves sound engineers do not, do not understand this. And they're constantly trying to overcome this physical aspect of it. So for the fledgling loud sound person, if you go and do a little research on potential acoustic gain, just do a Google search, potential acoustic gain equation, or, and read about this, and you'll find out that it's really the distances in the sound system that is the first thing that determines how loud they can be turned up. Not what mic it is, not what loudspeaker is, not what the amplifier it is, the distances. So like real estate, you know, and we location, do, location, location. Yes, and we do go into that in our um, Gain Before Feedback webinar. So yeah. sure.com mm-hmm. slash training, look up Gain Before Feedback, um, and that'll kind of start to dig you into that that world of gain structure. And right. Start there. 
It really has much, far more to do with that than which microphone you're using, assuming that it's a decent quality mm -hmm. microphone. And most, most pros with a big PA system, you need to work the microphone pretty close. Uh, you know, definitely within an inch or two just to get enough gain before mm. feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's typically the working distance where you start getting a little more proximity effect, you get a little more bass and warm up the sound. Mm -hmm. So most people like that working distance. Yep. Uh, if you're just giving a speech or a seminar or something like that, you know, you can be farther away like we are now and, you know, it can work out just fine. Read books. <laughs> read, read books. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, I've been doing sound forever, but, and, but they don't know... They know the twist the knobs, but they don't know why they're twisting the knobs. Mm -hmm. So, yep. okay, I have many 58s that the foam has rotted away in the ball, mm -hmm. but the and the foam uh, glued to the capsule is crumbling. Mm -hmm. Any mm -hmm. any thoughts to getting that taken care of? To mine, I, I don't know. I don't work in parts. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can buy just the foam inside or not. I think the last time I checked, you had to buy the the microphone and the actual. Yeah, I don't foam. think you can just get the foam. Um, the foam provides a little bit of pop protection, not much. Probably the simplest thing to do is just get a foam windscreen that goes over it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. rather than buying a new grill. But uh, to my knowledge, we don't sell the actual foam that goes inside of it. I don't think so. But again, so. It, it, it's only one layer, so it really doesn't do a great deal of uh, pop protection. Yeah, what really works in, in the way that grill works is you've got the steel mesh, mm -hmm. then you've got a thin layer of foam underneath, right. then you've got some airspace, right. then you've got some a little bit of foam, I think, on top of Absolutely. the mic element itself. Right. So it's the fact that the sound waves are, or air currents are passing through multiple layers. In, in multiple layers of different size holes. Yes, right, of different densities. Uh, or if you really want to get rid of all pee popping very simply, simply hold the microphone like Frank Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald used to do. Point it at the corner of your mouth, not underneath your nose, and all your popping problems absolutely go away. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Everybody's different as far as where their air currents. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of people have P problems. I have more problems down below with T and D Again, go going kind of down. Put it over to the side. Yeah. yeah like that'll, that'll go away. But underneath your nose, about the worst place it could be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's a good question for the historian. Wasn't one of the original ads for the SM, doesn't, didn't it show an SM57 uh, nailing in an uh, I nail with a hammer into a two by four. I don't remember that one. I do remember that Electric Voice used to advertise her 635s like that, mm -hmm. and we had an ad like that with our SM33 microphone mm. for a ribbon microphone. For a I ribbon. Do, for a ribbon microphone. I remember that. I do not remember a 57 ad hammering it. Ch hammers are cheaper, by the way. <laughs> and but you effective. probably True. could. <laughs> oh yeah, I think you probably could. True. So were 57s created for vocals or instruments? Ah. Uh, Hmm. They are primary since they don't have a pop, you know, a pop filter on them. They're primarily designed for things which don't pop. So either, you know, let's look at the White House, right? So the as president of the United States since Lyndon B. Johnson has used SM57s, but he uses them at about a distance about 18, 18 yeah, inches, 18, half, 20 yeah. inches away, like that. So it was really the case of having a microphone without a ball on it because the ball adds some price to it. And, and keep, some size. And some size, exactly. And keep in mind that in 1965 when it came out, almost all microphones that were end fires, were, they didn't have balls on them. Right. It was just sort of a straight cylinder. Right. So this really, the SM57 was a 545 without a switch and a dark finish on it. Uh, I don't think it was really any thought created for it as far as you know being an instrument mic. Of course, they've become famous now for micing snare drums and for micing guitar amps and for micing presidents. Mm-hmm. Okay, for the sake of comparison, what other brand microphones were similar with the 57 and 40, 58 during, during the old days and currently? Oh, boy. One of the big competitors was uh, the Audio-Technica uh, ATM-41. Oh, wow. Good memory. Right. That was a similar it, it, ball it, mic at a similar price point. And um, I guess I should say, are they still in production today? I, I don't know. I don't know if Audio Technica still sells that one or not. Um, Sennheiser had one. Remember the one that was um, Manhattan Transfer used a lot. Black handle had kind of like a, a grill that looked like a crown on a like a. I can't uh, model yes, number. I can't remember the model number. I can't believe we don't know our competitors' model number. Uh, <laughs> yes, so there have been a few. Electric Voice, so they stuck with the whole flat frequency response and low proximity for a long time. Mm -hmm. Until they came up with a series in the early '80s, which I don't remember the model uh, number. The uh, the Endyme. Uh, yes, right. yes, yes, and and that was right around the same time as the Beta. Right. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they actually beat us to it. They actually started using the neodymium magnets before we did. Mm-hmm. And that was a case of people would go into a store and they would try a 58, 58 and the neodymium from Electric Voice and all the same settings and the, and the Electric Voice was lo- louder because mm-hmm. the neodymium magnet had a stronger flux field. Right. And people, oh, it's louder. It's got to be better. Well, not <laughs> always, but that's how it, how it worked. Mm-hmm. So, sorry, I, you know, I just I don't remember some of those competitive models. Understandable. All right. Well, we are out of time. We thank you so much for joining us. Sorry. If support. But sure. If I'm, I'm getting there. She's, 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 she's such a, a pro. Wrap. I'm sorry. She's I'm backing off. Whole closing the wrap. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Um, so we want to thank you so much for joining us. Hope you learned a little bit today. Um, sorry if we did not get to your question. If you still have a burning question deep inside your soul about the SM58, um, you can send an email to support at shore.com. Just make sure in the subject line that you say something along the lines of SM58 question for Michael and that way it'll get straight to Michael and you can pick our historian's brain it's <laughs> What, what, what little it. is left. That's yes, it. exactly. Um, next month, we're going to be doing a session on wireless tips for guitar players on November 14th. Um, so you should see some information coming out shortly about that. Um, webinar archives at shore.com slash training. And once again, you can send any other questions you have about any other sort of audio topics to support at sure.com. we got a bunch of smart guys that can answer those questions for you. So we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next month. Have a great night.